if you have a localized particle in free space, uh, quantum particle in free space, it, it tends to smear out over time. And and this is that computation that, that uh, it's kind of a paradigmatic computation that, that shows how fast it spreads out and in what manner. Um, and it's actually a kind of nice baseline calculation in quantum mechanics because it it's straightforward to do. It can be done in closed form. You don't get a crazy looking formula at the end. You get a very cogent, nice looking formula at the end. And it's very easy to analyze. And it says a lot about quantum and it's a nice uh, excuse for talking about the general framework of quantum mechanics. So um, and in particular, the way I like thinking about quantum, which is a little different than the way physicists do it, I, I'm a little more mathy. And so math speaks to me uh, a little bit more than uh, the historical physics that led up to quantum mechanics, which is typically how physicists approach it. They, they talk about you know, things act like waves, so what do waves look like, and you know, what, eventually what is the wave equation, and how are position and momentum how do they enter and so forth. And it all comes from the history of waves. Um, I like doing it a bit different, you know, and. Um, yeah. This so. is uh, John Harland and oh. I am Andres Kulikowskis. This is Math for Wisdom. He explained uh, what he'll be teaching you, teaching me. Um, and uh, I'll just add that John has a PhD in functional analysis, uh, mathematics, uh, and I have a PhD in mathematics, uh, algebraic combinatorics. We studied together as graduate students at the University of California at San Diego. He currently teaches at Palomar College. He's uh, studying and investigating how to uh, relate the quantum physics and classical physics in a way that would satisfy him and namely how to uh, think of an alternative to the quote unquote collapse of the wave function. And inspired by him, we've been studying along each other for about three years um, uh, lately, and I've been working on a combinatorial alternative to the wave function. So John is sharing uh, a calculation about this question that um, will be very instructive for me. Uh, and so thank you, John. Let me explain. John has fantastic uh, insight into quantum physics, great intuition. He uh, had been thinking, and he was going to explain to me that when you have a wave packet and it's about the size of, let's say, a hydrogen atom, an electron in a hydrogen atom, that if you look at how that wave uh, packet uh, spreads, it spreads very fast. Uh, and so the question was, how fast? And he then decided to do this calculation. Is it faster than the speed of light? I think certain wave packets, if they're small enough, they are. And it turns out he did the calculation. That wave packet would be maybe like at 2% uh, of the speed of light, which is where you start to have relativistic effects that are non-trivial. So um, he was going to explain that uh, to me, and I said, let's record that. And he had like 30 pages of notes because basically what he's doing is he's giving the whole mathematical framework for his intuition into quantum mechanics. And as he's explaining, uh, traditionally how this was taught uh, to me and to him, uh, we have bachelor's degrees in physics. It's through a historical approach because people don't have PhDs in math as he does, as I do. Um, his being especially relevant in functional analysis. So the really mature way he thinks about this um, is very nice to see. And he's walking through that. Unfortunately, um, after about 30 minutes, we lost um, maybe more than half hour of uh, notes. Uh, and then he, in terms of recording, and then he continued recording further. And he will very likely, I hope, uh, redo all of this in a much more polished way. But if you want to be part of the Math for Wisdom raw community, that's you, that's us. Leave a comment, uh, be friends, join our uh, email group. Uh, maybe you'll join our physics study group. We love you, we want you. But we certainly love John for his intuition. So you get to see uh, how we walk through this. That's very fantastic. Um, 
So I'll pull up the slides just so that you can see where we're going, what you're missing. Here are John's notes. Uh, uh, spreading of wave function in free space, which we did not get to. Uh, but the basic setup, uh, which includes um, uh, this L2 functions uh, into the complex numbers. Um, and so he develops the notion of a wave function, which actually is uh, the whole notion of wave function is contrived. Um, and so I talk about an alternative to that. Um, but uh, then the notion of calculating observables and that uh, from his point of view, that observables are self-adjoint operators on uh, the uh, space of functions on L2. And so he defines the self-adjoint operators. He talks a lot about the Born rule and that this is a connection between the operator and measurement. And so you're taking these average values and uh, the time evolution of the wave function. So if it's um, you have a wave function um, with index t, uh, you can think of that in terms of the Schrodinger equation. So it's relating that. You can look at the Hamiltonian. And so the Schrodinger equation can be expressed in terms of the Hamiltonian. And you can um, solve it uh, explicitly. Um, I guess if you have that explicit solution, uh, then this uh, operator B will be self-adjoint. And so then he's able to uh, write that operator B as the uh, Lie algebra generator of the one parameter Lie group, um, which takes uh, time t to uh, u sub t. And so he makes this explicit. Uh, he's um, uh, supposing, um, I guess he's con showing how this u sub t becomes an exponential of the Hamiltonian. And then you can write it out uh, using a Taylor uh, series, a Maclaurin series. And then he talks about the spectral theorem, which uh, says if B is self-adjoint, uh, then the space of L2 functions will break down according to eigenspaces. And so then he um, talks about um, how you can um, write the initial uh, wave function at time t equals zero as a sum of these eigens functions, if I've gotten that right. And then he talks again about the Born rule. And he's saying uh, that it's about uh, an observable commutes, uh, let's say, with uh, this uh, delta, delta t, which is the Schrodinger equation, basically. And so if it's... Uh, he does this calculation and he shows uh, this is an operator uh, version of Noether's theorem, which has to do with uh, conserving uh, quantities. So if A is the infinitesimal generator of a symmetry, uh, then um, the Lie bracket of, or the, I guess the uh, commutator of A comma H uh, will equal to, uh, or anti commutator of A comma H equals zero. So he gets this formula. And then this is where um, uh, it picks up again, and he'll talk about the uncertainty principle. And then he'll, um, yeah, he talks about the uncertainty principle in terms of this. And Born rule gives connection between X and classical position. So he talks about uh, what it means to measure classical position and then taking the derivative. Uh, so I think this is with regard to momentum. What does that mean? So he's uh, deriving uh, what it means to have momentum or average momentum, expected uh, value of momentum. And then at the end, he'll talk about next time uh, one more thing like that. He wants to talk about the Schrodinger equation in momentum space, and then we'll do that calculation. So... Be our friend and listen in and hang out with us. Yeah, and this is just very crude. Uh, I'm sort of projecting this um, presentation with Andrews, and hopefully we'll do a more polished version of it um, shortly in the future. Let's just call this quantum mechanics in free space. But actually, we're going to talk about more general... Um, let's call this... this Let's call this the spreading... Or the wave function in free space. Although we're going to talk about 
the non-free space quantum mechanics to begin with, spreading can also be called dispersion. I like how you say smearing. <laughs> That's a, is that a possible, smearing. I guess? Also. Yeah, smearing, dispersion, smearing, whatever you want to call it. And so, um, so the whole, again, uh, you know, I have a sort of a math oriented approach to this whole thing. And so I'm going to be talking like in a fairly mathematical language with, with Andrews. Um, but hopefully these are breadcrumbs that if anybody's interested, they can investigate further. This is sort of the synthesis that I find of quantum mechanics that is understandable to me because I tend to favor um, mathematical constructs. Um, and again, they speak to me. Um, so, you know, it's, I know that it takes a bit more training than say, what's typically available to an undergrad in physics at the time. Uh, when I learned it as an undergrad, I knew that there was some deeper layer, you know, and so it, it disturbed me learning it the way physicists presented it. So I'm now at a point where I am okay with the foundations of quantum mechanics, but I, again, I tend to favor a fairly mathematical way, way of approaching it. Um, anyway, so the basic setup of quantum mechanics is a bit different than classical mechanics. And this is where I kind of, you know, with Andrews, I want to, you know, maybe talk about, let, let me, let me just write down the basic setup, but um, it might be good to talk about where this basic setup comes from. There's a certain logic behind it called quantum Boolean algebra or quantum sample space. Um, so here's what it looks like. The basic setup is that, first of all, you have L2 of R. And this is quantum mechanics in one dimension, being the set of functions. Uh, that are measurable in the sense of measure theory. But um, I mean, we could just think of them a little bit more simply as being functions that are square integrable that have a finite square. And actually, I sh I'm sorry, I should say that these are complex valued. Mm. Now, why we're interested in this. And well, let me just say <laughs> that, and that observables, okay. And typically, you know, the state or pre probability or wave function. of a quantum system you can call it a particle um so different authors use different terminology i don't really care what you call it um I guess I call it wave function just because that's historically what it's called, um, is a function that's an L2 function. And I'll just and, jump in uh, to say that these L2 functions, uh, uh, they do resonate with me when I'm working with the orthogonal polynomials that the integral looks like um you know you're you're you have the square of let's say something that like an orthogonal polynomial um 
um, times its weight function. You know, if you if you include the weight function. So when you when you um, try to show that it's orthogonal uh, or or uh, then then you're getting the square. So that's yeah, yeah. and um, you know, there's a and this weight function, yeah, it can change over time. Um, I should say that, you know, L2 has a little bit more structure on it. You can talk about um, the, maybe I, let me make a little bit of space here. And again, you know, we'll reflect on, you know, where all this come from. I mean, it just seems like a bunch of stuff just introduced Mm -hmm. ad hoc and you know but there are there there's a and it is kind of it is kind of ad hoc it is i mean the way this was discovered there was some intuition behind it you know with with uh bohr and de broglie um mm -hmm. introducing this concept of a wave function um but it was sort of by analogy to electromagnetic waves and it turns out these wave functions really don't behave like waves in space in 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 detail and um at least at least in all in all the manifestations of the phenomena that come from this consider you know quantum considerations mm -hmm. the wave function is sort of like an electromagnetic wave sort of not um and uh so there was intuition behind it but in the end it was sort of this ad hoc stuff uh that was kind of clued together based on previous knowledge of, of of fields and propagating waves in space and then and then some some key insights by heisenberg and schrodinger and dirac and um in the end it was sort of clued together and then and then von neumann in the 19 early 1930s wrote a book called the foundations mathematical foundations of quantum theory that kind of tied everything together into a working uh, uh circle you know a suite of ideas that became sort of the dominant way of thinking about things um uh and of course we'll talk about the born rule which is one of the key ingredients in all this stuff that happened uh before von neumann did his synthesis um, and, and I was speaking with uh, our friend uh, Thomas Gaidosek, who is a docent at the University of Vilnius and teaches both uh, quantum field theory and general <laughs> relativity. Uh, so uh, it's uh, always a treasure to get to talk with him. And so he confirmed that, like, the wave function as defined is really contrived. Um, that uh, that's just mathematic. It's just a mathematical tool. It's a mathematical. So what I'm trying to do is to say, well, if you actually look at the math. Um, from the point of view of like an algebraic combinatorialist, you have uh, ways of asking, well, what is actually natural? So when you interpret, let's say, integers and you look at what they're counting or constructing, you get to have a criteria for what is natural and not just something that you kludge together. Um, yeah, I think most physicists are okay with thinking, this, thinking of the whole thing as kludged up because... I think when you get to quantum theory, uh, field theory, the kludges get <laughs> uh, much more elaborate and are on, uh, um, you have to kind of accept, you know, the fact that it is ad hoc because there is no, there is no, um, well, you know, mathematically san sanguine way of, of navigating through it. It requires tremendous insight and skill and, and, intuition mm -hmm. to know how to navigate through those those computations so it really is a kludge and it, it it's just that you know physicists learned over time how to deal with that kludge and and you know it you know some major major knowledge came out of it uh some major and, and, break, and so break, there's... Break, breakthroughs in, in knowledge about the physical universe came out of it so it really is at this point you know even though you can make quantum mechanics kind of look very logical at its foundations and it, it is when you get to quantum field theory i don't think that is the case it, i think that it um in in the details of the computations it you know kind of there's something more going on than the 
than can be described at the cur current time in terms of mathematical foundations. And, and, and there's, a, there's a there's a there's a hundred years of insight, you know, that's precious and valuable from you know hundreds of thousands of physicists working. And so, um, but what I'm trying to do, and and you're trying to do, I think, in different ways, are to uh, figure out like, is there something new or more? Uh, but like, so in my approach, I'm trying to say, look, this cognition can be a helpful guide to what's actually natural. So when you write psi of t, psi sub t of x, it could be written psi of t comma x, and then there's this whole issue, like in relativity, oh, yeah. like you know, how does t and x? But the fact that you write it the way you do, uh, and this may come up, but uh, t is thought more as an index, and x is thought more as a um, you know yeah. a variable, and yeah. that's a cognitive thing. So it is. Um, it is. They're more on equal footing in relativity theory, but not exactly equal because time has a different has a different signature than than space mm -hmm. in relativity theory. They're not quite equal, and uh, you know, even when you relativize all this stuff, you know, the Dirac equation, time and the time variable and x variable are not symmetric. They're not. Mm -hmm. They 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 transform into each other via Lorentz transformations, but Lorentz transformations doesn't treat t and x on equal footing. So mm -hmm. it it uh they're more equal, <laughs> but not quite. And so uh yeah, so so in standard quantum mechanics, the nice thing about standard quantum mechanics is that it's simpler and it actually is a very good approximation, as we'll see. Um toward the end, we're gonna get <clears throat> Even you know considerations this simple um, actually kind of point out that that you're up against the hairy fringe of relativity theory even in uh, even in uh, a situation like a hydrogen atom where you're confining a quantum particle to a pretty a pretty uh, tight uh, region of space that relativity theory you can kind of see it creeping in at the very end of what we're going to see so and, and uh, you'll be doing this practical calculation in yeah this we'll, very we'll do it and it, it's kind of it's fun and and just to you know for a, a reader to uh if somebody's listening to uh be aware of there's a proviso here that all the quantum mechanics that we're going to be talking about is an approximation of the more precise quantum mechanics given by the relativistic treatment and we we do this kind of quantum mechanics because it it is it's simpler and it's it's the paradigm for the more advanced quantum mechanics but it is non-relativistic and so it's only approximate okay okay so yeah we think of uh state of the system or wave function as being at each time t we have an l2 function and um and so um observables in other words quantities that we can actually measure are um, given by self-adjoint operators. Again, there's an overlay that um, we can talk about why this makes logical sense when we're trying to model quantum mechanics, why you have to go to such an elaborate edifice to talk about quantities and quantum mechanics because you know quantities and classical mechanics are simply functions of x y z and t you know why can't we use those in quantum mechanics and there's a reason for that and the reason is that they don't model the logic of quantum mechanics and so we can you have to go to what's called a quantum boolean uh boolean algebra or 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 you know quantum probability space you know in order to mo model those those uh more elaborate kinds of phenomena that happen in quantum mechanics and it turns out that that the natural things that come up 
are are self-adjoint operators. Um, and there's a particular reason why they come up, and that can be a, that can all be explained. It's like there is a there's a logical foundation for that. And so I thought that it might be good to start with that. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, because you might not have seen that before, Andres, and it's actually quite beautiful. It's always always interesting to see from your point of view. And yeah, it's always it's, right it's, up, right? but yeah. but also I want to say that. When you say self-adjoint, I think of adjunctions in category theory uh, because they have a similar type of form. So I don't know exactly how to connect the two, but uh, I'm always on the lookout. So linear operators, it's a self-adjoint linear operator. In other words, its adjoint is equal to itself. And what adjoint means is that A, F, G is equal to f a star g. So you can always, for every operator, you can always define an adjoint operator mm -hmm. um, in this equation here. And it turns out that self-adjoint operators are their own are their own adjoints. Again, there's a reason why self-adjoint operators are natural in this context of quantum Boolean algebra. But um, again, that's a that's maybe something we should start with sort of a the philosophical or meta mathematical underpinnings of quantum mechanics so uh, that's kind of where i wanted to start i didn't have time to prepare mm -hmm. so maybe maybe next time we'll talk about that okay good I, I find it i find it uh you know once i once i understood that you know and i got it from various sources uh and actually von neumann has this i think in his book why these are not are the natural objects for for observables um but once i once i started coming to grips with that i i, I felt a lot better about this whole kludgy inter you know edifice mm -hmm. um okay and here's how these are connected with the real world and this is called the born rule This is the connection between a self-joint operator and measurement. And here's what it is. That the expected value of a measurable is you take that measurable and operate on the wave function and take the inner product with a wave function. So written out, this is just going to be A operating on the wave function times the conjugate of the wave function, complex conjugate of the wave function, integrated over x. And we'll, we're going to look at specific examples of this down below. Anyway, this mm -hmm. is the setup. And um, and the Ham Hamiltonian would be an example, right? Like so. Yes. And, and spatial and, and, and momentum measurements, for example. Average value of an observable A. So that's what it is. Now it's going to change over time. And uh, so the, the spatial example would be like multiplying by x, right? Right. And, and, and then, then you would again like have something that's uh, that'd be like the moment for an orthogonal, uh, the moment uh, for x for an orthogonal. No. Yeah. Would it? I'm confused. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, it's the. Um, No, be careful. Um, no, it'd be x times psi of x. Yeah. Right, but only that. Okay, so I made a mistake there. Well, yeah, no, it's, it's kind of a it's kind of a moment um, of it's a certain kind of moment. I mean, if you think of um, 
Okay, you would have to multiply x times psi of x, and then yeah, you no, would. I mean, yeah, I mean, we could work that out a little bit. You down. would Let's rewrite it, right? Okay, so the, that's you would rewrite it. Okay, that's when something we talk about different. The position, when we talk about the position operator, maybe we can rewrite it, mm -hmm. um, and we'll, we can rewrite it in terms of of uh, eigenfunctions, and then I think you get um, mm -hmm. you get the first moment of x. Uh, with respect to that eigenfunction, if you're in an eigenstate, um, I, I, the first moment of that, of that, I'm sorry, that probability distribution given by an eigenstate. So um, let's, okay, let's go on here. Mm -hmm, um, please, yeah. All right. And so, so that's the general abstract setup. There's actually, you know, I mean, from a mathematical point of view, it's actually pretty, you know, it's, it's, it's not not a very elaborate edifice. Now, mm -hmm. how does the time evolution of the state or wave function that's given by the Schrodinger equation? Mm -hmm. So what you had above is all for a fixed time t, right? It's all for a fixed mm -hmm. time t. So okay. you want to know how does the wave function vary with with time or, you know, basically, you know, what defines, you know, what is what are the constraints on the wave function? And they're given by the Schrodinger equation, which is I h bar, the derivative with respect to time of the wave function is equal to, and this is evaluated at x, is equal to negative h bar squared over 2m, the second derivative with respect to x of the wave function, plus the potential times x. That's the basic Schrodinger equation. Mm -hmm. It was written down in, I think, 1926, a year after Heisenberg um, discovered the matrix mechanics, you know, mm -hmm. version of of, uh, of quantum mechanics, where he didn't talk about these wave functions, and um, he talked about state vectors instead of wave functions. And I think it was Schrodinger who realized that oh, they're both just different representations of L two, and that's why you know Heisenberg gets his thing, I get my thing, but mine gives a spatial interpretation, and Heisenberg. Uh, gives exactly the same abstract interpretation. We get exactly the same energy levels, but this, the wave function gives you kind of the spatial interpretation. In, in particular, allows you to write down the uh, the measurable uh, x, the the self adjoint operator that corresponds to measuring uh, position. So, okay, so. Um, So a, a more consolidated way of writing this down is you write down uh, this self-adjoint operator h equals negative h bar squared over 2m derivative with respect to x, second derivative with respect to x, plus multiplication by v of x. So M of any uh, F of X would on operating on a, on a function G would be equal to just F of X times G of X. And that is a self-adjoint operator. The second derivative is a self-adjoint operator. First derivative is anti-self-adjoint, but the second derivative is self-adjoint. So this mm. is a joint operator, sum of two self-adjoint operators is self-adjoint. And, and um, we can write the Hamil the Schrodinger equation and, and that's very interesting what you said that so you don't ever have a single derivative uh you always have the second derivative because uh, you need it to... no well we're, we're going to see that um for uh, x right like it yeah, to, to have, an, to have well, a self adjoint no, operator have a single direct you can say have a single derivative it's just you've got to have an i in there so that it's uh, oh then you have to have an i okay yeah. that's what, so that'd be the case with momentum. Momentum. momentum is that right or right Okay, thanks for correcting me. Because, you know, when you uh, flip over to here, uh, 
notice that the uh, the inner product is linear in the first slot and mm -hmm. conjugate linear in the second. Okay. And so yeah, you've got to uh, for if you want if you want your this to be a, a self adjoint operator, you better have an I in there. Otherwise, when you flip it over here, uh, you're going to get mm -hmm. a. So that's mm -hmm. you know, and you can see from like integration by parts, you get a negative in there with a differentiation operator. Mm -hmm. So you get the negative unless you have an I in there. Um, and again, it's conjugate linear in the second second entry of the. This is great. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. No, I thought this would be a good thing for you because you're kind of prepped for it. You're primed for it. Uh, of course, uh, people haven't been through this before, and especially even if even if you've had an undergraduate mm -hmm. background in quantum mechanics, we're we're talking pretty mathy here. So um, mm -hmm. this may not appeal to someone with a pure physics background that much because. Um, I don't know, it's it's more it's more about the mathematical structure than it is about you know the actual physical interpretation although we're, we'll we'll talk about that in in just a bit okay and so this is the classic way of writing the Schrodinger equation mm. all right and what you, and have, what you have also, also you, have you have kinetic, kinetic and potential, potential. that's and right potential. kinetic and potential okay that's right so you can under, you can ask yourself where does the Schrodinger equation come from? And I mean, there's a lot of different ways of, of evolving the Schrodinger equation. I have my own particular, mm -hmm. you know, pet way of doing it. But it's um, it's kind of good to uh, maybe kind of healthy to just accept it as kind of one of the laws of physics. In other words, you can try to. Mm -hmm. You know, you could try to make sense of it like like Maxwell's equations. You could try to make sense of those. Oh, you do this experiment, you do that experiment, and there's this connection between electricity and magnetism or between uh, between sources and fields. Um, but in, in the end, where do Maxwell's equations come from? They come from a bunch of measurements and, mm -hmm. and abstracting those measurements into a mathematical formalism. It really is kind of the same thing here. You know, you can try to, you know, you can try to justify the Schrodinger equation any number of ways. And, you know, I like Feynman's way of doing it. Uh, it's really, really clever. Um, but in the end, he has to admit that where does this all come from? You know, yeah, you can sort of make sense of it in terms of, you know, his particular toy model, you know, where he mm -hmm. kind of evolves, you know, and it, it really is, it really is very pretty, but, you know. What's, uh, what's the gist of his... Uh... No, I forget what it is, but he he, he does a he does a, a toy model lattice of of just a one dimensional lattice of a bunch of uh, a bunch of sites sort of exchanging uh, mm. energy and you know show. I like should he, look into that. That's in his lecture level, notes. He right? builds up two. Yeah, he builds up two level quantum systems. It really is a very. It was really important for me to read Feynman because he showed the basic structures of quantum mechanics with just a two-level spin system and you know mm -hmm. all the unitary dynamics and all, you know, everything that comes out of quantum mechanics and it says what if we put these things together in a lattice in one dimensional lattice and then what does it look like you know in terms of the overall hamiltonian and then he kind of derives something that looks like the schrodinger equation takes the limit and and says oh but lo and behold you get this schrodinger equation you know and um but you know that's comes from a particular toy model that he develops and says oh this actually works in general and how do we know it works in general well you have to just accept it you know but it is well, a, so, it's a rather pretty way of of like if you don't believe the Schrodinger equation and you want something some model toy model for understanding it you know it's rather rather beautiful what he does well um, and so I'm I'm getting to the point uh, you know I've we, we've kind of journeyed together but I'm getting to the point where with these um, Schefter polynomials, uh, these orthogonal Schefter polynomials, I'm I'm able to start to try to reinterpret these things. So, like in my reinterpretation, it doesn't seem like there really is a potential. Uh, there really is just different space-time wrappers, you know. It's so, 
uh, it's so it really is about the kinetic energy. So, but so like if I were to go and study Feynman's toy model, as you call it, I could get some, I could look to say, hmm, how does this relate to what I'm finding in the combinatorics? Yeah. And maybe there's actually a connection there. That'd be very interesting to yeah. learn how, what's, what's to be interpreted there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that'll be another video. <laughs> so if we get that far, hopefully. Yeah, and I think I think you'll see that. I mean, I think if you read Feynman's lectures, you'll see like the way I approach quantum mechanics is very, very much influenced by, by you know, mm -hmm. his encouragements in in thinking about toy models um, in in those in the book, you know, in the Feynman lectures. And, and not, I think, you know, 99% of physicists don't go that route. So, you know, you're in the 1% that does. And I think that's, ex so it's very exciting. That's why we're making yeah. this video. Yeah, I mean, I, I do have, I, I think it's, I think developing finite dimensional quantum mechanics before infinite dimensional is really a, a great way to do it. It has influence, like I, it definitely had an influence on, on pedagogy. Like if you look at Grithos. Mm -hmm. He doesn't mm -hmm. go the Feynman route, but he does wrap around to spin one half pretty quickly. And, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, where, you know, talking about spin was not part of the early quantum mechanics books. Like we never talked about spin when I learned mm -hmm. it. And I think it's a real mistake because all the formalisms of quantum mechanics are there in a, in a, in a two state system, you know, where the mm -hmm. Hamilton is just a two by two matrix, you know? And um, so like everything you need to understand the underpinnings of quantum mechanics are are there in the two state system and and then there's some very interesting physics that comes out of spin one half uh, some very seminal physics um in terms of understanding the mysteries of quantum mechanics like non-locality in in bell mm -hmm. you know bell's inequalities and non-locality you don't need to talk about the schrodinger equation to understand that mm -hmm. uh, really it, it's a way of isolating sort of the 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 core phenomenon of quantum mechanics without going through any of this, any of this more elaborate infinite dimensional formalism. And so I like it for that reason. Um, I don't so much like the end of the Feynman lectures when he talks about symmetry and stuff. I think it, it's not as clear as I'd like it to be. Um, and so, uh, but I think it's an important resource, you know, I mean, just um, he's someone who thought as deeply about quantum as anybody ever has, I think. And mm -hmm. and uh, also, you know, he had really, really great mathematical chops. Um, so he wasn't afraid of uh, any level of abstraction of mathematics. You didn't you didn't find it onerous. And um, so so, for example, you know, he looks at something like this. And, you know, thanks to Feynman, I now know how to think about this uh, equation. That what's really happening is that, you know, if you have an equation like this, you can write down the solution. The explicit solution is like this. It's just kind of great. Just based on pure mathematics. And I talked to you and you and... Um, Thomas at length last year, I think about this, that the explicit solution of this differential equation I should maybe not use a here let's yep, let's use a different operator let's call it b so check this out you can easily write down the general solution you can easily write down the specific i'm sorry the the specific solution the the explicit solution like this
Now, what is this U of T? It turns out that this is an operator. T goes to U2 is a unitary group in the sense that U2 is unitary. That's the complex analog of rotation, mm -hmm. right? Oh, I see. And then you can multiply them, right? Yeah, and u of t plus s is equal to u of t, u of s. And explicitly, how are u and b connected? u of t is just simply equal to the exponent of b of t. So it's easy to see, say, this property from this, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because of the way the exponential works. Right. And also, you can recover B from U. It's just the IH bar. Uh, I'm sorry, there should be a negative here. Um, negative. It's IH bar times the derivative of U of T evaluated at T equals zero. In other words, B is the one parameter, is the generator. And and this, uh, I've asked before at Math Stack Exchange about the orthogonal, you know, about the Scheffer polynomials because uh, you take the generating function, you get a of t times e to the x u of t, so it has very much like this type of Lie group, um, yes, you know, Lie algebra structure. Yeah, it'd be nice and, to. And and so I asked like how it relates, and somebody explained it to me, but I didn't, um, I didn't quite understand it. I have to kind of go back and really try to. Maybe yeah, ask again to understand it. I think, I think uh, let me, you know, my computer is acting a little strange. Let me say this so that we don't, we don't. Uh, explicit solution of the Schrodinger equation, you know, involves, you know, using uh, this one parameter, one parameter to unitary group, and then you can actually write it out. And if you've got eigenfunctions, you can actually write it out in terms of the eigenfunctions. And then the question is, how do you find the eigenfunctions? Well, you might have symmetries. You already that you've already explored, you know what the eigenfunctions of those symmetries are, and therefore you know some of the eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian. So that's where symmetries come in. Um, anyway, uh, you know you get this explicit formula in terms of eigenfunctions if you can find them, um, and uh, and then if you want to know the time evolution, I think that we already then we plugged in already yeah. the time evolution of an operator is given by its commutator with a Hamiltonian. And then you look at the time evolution of the position operator and you find out that it has to be then associated with this sucker here mm -hmm. or that's momentum. Is well, this was good for me. So, so I'll be able to. That comes mm -hmm. from the commutator of position with the Hamiltonian. So yeah. anyway, we missed some of the recording here, but yeah, no, I think I think this is it. I think I think this is now that I'm thinking about it, um, this Nerther theorem and you know the role of symmetries is all about this, it's all about this equation right here. This is it. Mm -hmm. Simply it. And you know, and why do symmetries help you? It's because they if you if you know the symmetries of your of your operator, in other words, the self-adjoint operators that commute with it, then and you know the spectral decomposition of those operators, you know the at least partially the spectral decomposition of your Hamiltonian. So they're just they're just like helper. Uh they're they're like uh they're like one of the tool one of the tool bags for simplifying the spectral theory.
Um, and so I think that's pretty much it. It's like, um, it's not rocket science. It's like, it's like a very basic fact about it is rocket science, John. But, but what it, what it, <laughs> it I mean, this is how, <laughs> of course, this is so rocket it, it science. Is, it's rocket but, science, but rocket science 101, you know, so it's, okay. it's, not, it's not super deep. The reason why symmetries play such a central role in quantum mechanics and in spectral theory is this very reason here that that if a commutes if a is a infinitesimal generator of a of a symmetry and it commutes with a hamiltonian then it's a constant of the motion and also if you know the spectral decomposition of a then you partially know the spectral decomposition of h well and in, in in my mind uh, my primitive mind but it's saying really that the it's about the link between time and energy or the Hamiltonian, you know, saying that as soon as you say something innocuous, like, oh, I'd like to see how this changes with regard to time. Well, then that's what the Hamiltonian is all about. So, um, and, and Schrodinger equation is basically saying that. So, so and Nerder's I theorem links the two. Mm-hmm. So one last one last ingredient before we talk about specifically um, wave packets in space and free space dispersion and all that. Um, what I'd like to do is talk about the uncertainty principle. Mm -hmm. Did I spell that right? Prince. Uh, yes, oh. L-E. Mm -hmm. um, and what that says, and it's akin to what we just did here. It's not that much more, you know, it's about as complicated as what we just did. And I'm not going to derive it. It's saying that uh, if you have a self-adjoint operator, I'm going to use, I'm going to do, um, there's different ways of writing it down, but I I, I like the way Rith, Griffiths writes it down. So let me just go to mm -hmm. his. And I swear I've, <laughs> I've like derived this for myself like probably five different times. And I and every time I do it, I have to kind of rediscover like how it's done. It's 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 a little bit of a, mm -hmm. it's a slightly um If you, you know, I mean, there's, it's a slightly subtle kind of computation, but um, if you define, um, I'm just going to say for, you know, for an operator T, if you define this to be, oh, what is it? It's exactly what you think it would be. Um, it's the expected value mm -hmm. of the expected value of T minus I mean, it's exactly what you get in probability theory. So it's really just this: you get t, mm -hmm. you subtract its average value, which you, which is mm -hmm. gotten by the Born rule, and you operate on you go like this. Mm -hmm. Now remember, t um, average is just is just uh, a number. So you're taking mm -hmm. uh, T minus a number and that's a self-adjoint operator. And and so that's gonna be the variance of a observable. Mm -hmm. And that's an expression of the uncertainty. It is. And so it's, um, here's the uncertainty principle. If I, 
um, if you take the variances and you multiply them together, that's going to be greater than or equal to It's like a half page derivation to do this, but I like the way you take the com commutator, mm. square this whole thing. Uh, the commutator is going to be an anti self adjoint operator. And so it's actually going to have an I in it. So you have to cancel that I to get a real quantity and so when you square this right hand side you'll get an actual an actual I, you know maybe it's better doing it this way um i mean why don't i just write it this way oh i see you're saying the commutator will be uh complex and so this takes that away makes it yeah really but it, i don't know it's just isn't it better just writing it this way one over one half of uh, the absolute value the absolute value uh yeah you just put absolute value son uh i'm sorry just put absolute value bars right oh i'm sorry we need that we need an average value of that Yes. And you want to put the absolute value bars or? Yeah. And that's why you need the one over I to make it a, you see that this is not a, yeah, that's right. It's not a, it's, you need it one over I to make it into a, to make it in, uh, see, we, we only, A, A, B is not, A, the commutator of A, B, A bracket B is not, bracket A, B is not a self adjoint operator. One over I times A, B is a self adjoint operator. Okay. Okay, so that becomes a self-adjoint operator. You need to take its average of a self-adjoint operator, which we know how to do, mm -hmm. and you square that. And of course, you need a one half in there. So, mm -hmm. so this is maybe a more uh, so that's a self-adjoint operator. You take its average and take the absolute value of that. So that's the uncertainty principle without the squares. Okay. Okay. All right. And again, and that's uh, I have to remember that that's the, absolute, the average, not the conjugate. Yeah, the, the absolute for T self adjoint, uh, the average value of it by the Born rule is that. Okay. okay. That's what it means. Um, okay. So there we go. That's that's um, that's an uncertainty principle. Now let's let's talk about. I think all the ingredients are there. Let's look at the self-adjoint operator. Multiplication by X. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's see, by the Born rule, multiplication by X, it's average. And there might be, there might be a time dependence on this. That's equal to m multiplication by x times let's just write out the bra the, the bracket notation first. M x psi sub t psi sub t. Okay, and what does this really mean? It means the integral from negative infinity to infinity of x psi t of x psi t bar of x dt, which is equal to this. Mm -hmm. Now, psi t is normalized. Why, why is that integral of dt, or is it d dx? X? Thank you. Thank you. OK, I know something. <laughs> Right. I got that figured out. Thank you. Um, so so psi t is normalized.
It doesn't have to be. Um, like, if you look at the Schrodinger equation, um, it works for a non-normalized. Uh, mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be normalized. But you make the assumption... without loss of generality, that this mm -hmm. is normalized. Okay. In other words, this is dividing through by whatever you yeah, need to. Yeah, this, which is equal to psi t, psi t. Um, and then you have to take the square root of that is equal to one. Okay, and that means the integral against itself. Yeah, yeah. You were saying psi t is real or not? Psi t is not real. Yeah, but okay, but, but you have to you have to put the bar there, right? But to yeah, conjugate. when you when you multiply by its complex conjugate, you get a real number. So, <clears throat> any number, any function that's normalized, it's modulus squared is a probability density. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the Born rule, let's interpret the Born rule. Um, This is a probability measure. Mm -hmm. And so this is equal to the expected value of X at T. Mm -hmm. In other words, the average value of multiplication by X is equal to the expected value of x as a x as just a variable. Mm -hmm. So that means mx, the observable multiplication by x, can be conflated or interpreted as. As position because it gives the average it's it's i see it's average value by the born rule is the average position if you consider this a probability density over position mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay so why is multiplication by x position i mean it's just some abstract thing well it gives you it 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 has a probabilistic interpretation as average x, where x well, and that's and, and that's very interesting in the sense that um, it's giving the integral is giving the context for it, and that's much in the spirit of what I'm doing. Like to say, well, that's the space time wrapper or whatever. Like you know, you, but you're like you're saying, like you in that context, multi, you know, x is a multiplication. Yes, by x, <laughs> so so um. Out of context, you know, X is, you know, what we'd call a position, let's say. But in but in that context, it's a multiplication by X. So yeah. So in a sense, X tracks or identifies position in a quantum sense. In that if you take the average of X, this parameter X, mm -hmm. over the probability density uh, given by the wave function, you get the average of this operator, the average of this observable. So to me, this is what justifies calling M multiplication, multiplication by X the observable position.
I know it's a, it's a bit of a subtle point, but it's important, you know, like if you're going to make connection with, you know, something that you consider some thing in the, in the real macroscopic world, um, the born rule is what gives you that connection. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see, because uh, it's the square of the thing that's giving you the probability, right? So... So really, you know, we depend on the Born rule to connect with, mm -hmm. you know, like macroscopic interpretation of mm -hmm. underneath it all, you know, what is this wave function telling us? Well, I mean, we sort of interpret it as a wave, but it really is not because if you have two particles, the wave function is over two position variables, which is R6, it's six dimensional. Like mm -hmm. it's even six dimensions, you know. I mean, it's 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 troublesome. I mean, I mean, Schrodinger really effort, you know, made a big effort to try to make all this cogent. And that book by Travis Norson kind of unpacks that history and you know, like how how physicists really really struggle with this interpretation of psi is actually a physical wave. Um, in, in, is this coming like from the idea that, well, there's a wave equation and so Schrodinger equation is like a wave equation? Yeah, that... I mean, that, I mean that's, that was the original insight of Schrodinger, but then he realized that there was a problem, you know, when you get mm -hmm. to two particle systems, like what kind of wave is that? And he, he didn't make an attempt to, to, you know, try to interpret it as a three dimensional wave, you know, or, you know, like a you know, like a, or a packet of three dimensional well, ways. You, I mean, I, like to have gotten to this part and like having taken, you know, four quarters or whatever quantum mechanics. And yeah, that's like, uh, I never could understand like, well, in what sense is this a wave really? You know, like it was always a kind of like, um, you know, like a lack in my imagination, you know, just to say, well, somehow, somewhere, but, but I guess, so, and that kind of emboldens me too, because like when I look at it from the point of view of those orthogonal Schaeffer polynomials, it's really not about squaring it. It's about this orthogonality and what it's saying, basically, it's like, a, I don't use the word perturb, but I use the word um, kind of like wiggle or something like, you know, you, you, you take one of those pollen, you know, it's basically, if you have two polynomials, they better be the same when you integrate, otherwise you're going to get zero. And if you have those two polynomials, you take one of them, you wiggle it, you multiply it, let's say by x. That's like a wiggle, and and if it if it if it it's going to take you away from maybe momentarily, like take you away from the polynomial you had and give you a bunch a combination of new ones. But anything that wasn't back to the original one is going to give you zero. So yeah, right. it's just like a little wiggle, like to say, okay, I'm going to wiggle it and see what happens when it comes back and how much it comes back like what's the chance of it coming back so to speak uh, and yeah. then that's your that's your um that's what you're calculating it's yeah. like the probability of you know coming back when you wiggle and what i what i think of is the the born rule is the only thing we have to really connect with macroscopic reality mm -hmm. that's that's what we rely on. I mean, that's why it's such a big deal. You know, um, the Born rule, that insight, I think, was the key insight, you know, that says quantum can be quantum. Mm -hmm. Let quantum be quantum, you know. Mm -hmm. Like, it is some weird thing. You don't even need spatial coordinates to talk about it. You can talk about matrix mechanics. You can talk about any other mm -hmm. representation. You don't need L2. You can you could talk about any other Hilbert space. And... But, you know, in the end, you have these observables and the way you connect back to measurement is through the Born rule, you know, and mm -hmm. um, and some people said, you know, and I think my, I'm pretty sure, you know, my expert physicist who taught me my quantum mechanics back in undergraduate days, 
told told us that well you know um wave mechanics is weird because uh it's got a complex number in it and so don't be too don't be too, you know don't overly interpret this as a real wave because it's not as complex mm -hmm. value as an abstraction that's nonsense this is two coupled real equations, just like you get coupled differential equations in mm -hmm. those equations. It's just absolute nonsense to think that way. Mm. This is just a, it's a compact way of writing coupled differential equations. Well, and then that suggests it's, it's this whole notion of symplectic geometry, right? Like where you have a, that's coupled equations yeah, that I mean, relate uh, position uh, and I, momentum, I let's that, say. I, I think that the, I think that you know really the the that's the healthier way of thinking about that I think is is that there's a comp there's a connection between symplectic geometry and unitary dynamics mm -hmm. but, um the unitary dynamics you know it's going to have the ion you know it's like uh so I mean it's just a it's a it's a representation of a of a it's a it's a linear representation of symplectic uh, dynamics where uh, it's dictated by these one parameter Lie groups. Um, so well, and you know. and that type of coupling, like you say, between you know with this slack, I think of it as modeling slack, which is very important for wondrous wisdom. It's the structure of good, let's say. But that uh, that's kind of like what waves are all about, anyways. Uh, so that's maybe where the waves kind of make sense, right? In the sense that it's uh, it's uh, maybe simplest form of coupling or not. Yeah. I um I just think that we have to be where nature gives us an easy path to represent things as waves, consider it a gift. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, consider it a it, it's like consider it, oh, there's this analogy that allowed us to bridge up to quantum mechanics that's just kind of incidental. You know, it's not, mm -hmm. not the deeper structure, but it was enough It was enough of a bridge for us apes to get across with our old concepts and start and start exploring a new world. You know, mm -hmm. it's the Bering Strait, but mm -hmm. it's, it's the gateway drug to quantum mechanics, but it's not, <laughs> it's, not, it's, not the, uh, it's not the actual grist of quantum mechanics. Anyway, so let's uh, speaking of speaking of which let let's get down to momentum uh since we got position kind of nailed down yeah. let's talk about momentum and where does momentum come from it comes from looking at changes in position hmm. so here we we've been here we have What is that? What is our formula here? One over IH bar. God, I hope I got that one over IH bar right. Should it be times one over I? I don't know. We'll find out. I might have screwed up. We'll find out. It, we'll correct ourselves. I think it's one because you had to. Yeah, I know. I had to. I had to write the one over IH bar times the Hamiltonian, right? To I to get back so. to okay. Because you were doing with. Delta delta t, right? Yeah. Well, That's we'll find out. Were... We'll find out if I I was okay. So this is going to be one over i h bar um, commutator m x and h. Did I write that correctly? I should have written a bar over that. Okay, so one over uh, the commutator M X and H is another self-adjoint operator. It's an observable. It's uh well with a one over i. Yeah, definitely you need the one over i there to make it self-adjoint. So, um, because a commutator is anti-self-adjoint um, to begin with. So you have to multiply by plus or minus i to make it self-adjoint. Okay, so let's uh, let's just figure out what this is. Um, M X H is equal to uh we have to write it out it's like um that means it's x times h 
let's first of all, let's operate on a dummy function f. So just as a bookkeeping thing. Um, so it's x times, well, unfortunately, we have to actually write out the Hamiltonian. So we're first operating on f. And we're subtracting uh, this is mx, then h on f, then minus h mm -hmm. mx. Operating on xf. Mm -hmm. Now notice that x times vh times f is the same thing as v times xf. Mm -hmm. So that stuff cancels. That'll cancel. Nice. And now we just got this commuting stuff. Okay, so we can factor out the minus h bar squared over 2m. And then we just have to figure out what x, the double derivative, is minus x f double derivative. Mm -hmm. I think. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So just, just uh, use the product rule and figure it out. This x double derivative minus the derivative. The, the derivative, the first derivative is going to be x f uh, prime plus f. That's the product rule. But then we have to take the second derivative of that. That's going to be negative h bar squared over 2m x f prime minus. Okay. So we have a. Uh, the first term we have to now we're subtracting with some parentheses f, yeah f double prime uh, minus f prime and then minus f prime so these cancel and we get minus 2 h bar so we get uh, minus two, so that cancels the minus two. The minuses cancel, and we get h bar squared over m times f prime. Okay, so that means that the derivative of the average of x is going to be one over i h bar times this stuff. It's going to be one over i h bar times h bar squared over m times f prime. That's operating on f, which is, um, I like to write it like this, h bar over i m times the derivative with respect to x of f. So that means that now i don't know why i i should have used the wave function at this point because that's what's meaning you know mm -hmm. what's meaningful here so i'm sorry this is um okay so that means if I multiply both sides by m, the derivative, I'm sorry, m times the derivative, the average of. Just just to go back, uh, is there a psi, it should be psi sub t on it the should, middle one, should, middle yes, term? Yes, it should be, yeah. And is there a psi sub t in the first term? No. No, because the t, the t is embedded here, okay. So, so let's write it like this. This is going to be h bar over i times d dx psi t. So this is the average momentum.
this is momentum average. Now, I want to be careful about the way I express momentum here. I, I don't want to be, I don't want to get too carried away. I guess I should just say PT average is mm -hmm. equal to H bar. Oh, I'm sorry. And I dropped, I'm sorry, I dropped. I dropped the bar on there. Uh, so I'm sorry about that. There should have been a bar over that, bar over that. Um, and actually, I don't need the psi t here. Um, What am I doing here? I have to. I actually have to apply this. Whatever I. That's what I was wondering. Let's be. Let, let's let's be. Let's be careful here. No. So this is bad notation. I'm sorry. Let's go back and change this. First of all, let's complete this. This is h bar squared over m times the derivative with respect to x of f and that's really what we want so that's this that's the self-adjoint operator uh where did the i go oh it, it's right here so this we need the one over i d d x and then we need the average of that in according to the born rule that's so I just wrote out this explicitly because I figured out what this commutator is. In other words, mx h is equal to. So this whole thing implies that mx h is equal to h bar squared over m gdx. That's what I know. That's what that operator is. And then going and so back, if, if you have the if you have the size sub t on the right, you need it on the left also, right? Correct. Well, the thing is, I'm. I don't have a. I'm. I don't need a psi. You know, we don't have a psi of t here. It's implied in the Born rule. What this means. No, right. But you put it there on the on the bottom. I, I know. I didn't you, mean. I. I didn't but then mean, you. Yeah, I got to well, get, on, I gotta the, get on that row. I got to get rid of it. Yeah, or you should include it in both, right? Or I don't know. No, that. no, because we're talking about averages, which already have the size. Oh, I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. So my my notation was just not very good. Okay, so this is average momentum. Is equal to the average of this operator. So mm -hmm. h bar over i ddx is interpreted by the Born rule as so the Born rule says that this is momentum mm. And actually, um, Griffiths does this. He, he does a great service to his students mm -hmm. to do this derivation, showing that, yeah, we got it by other means, by thinking of things as waves, and, you know, like this would then pull down the momentum, you know, from a wave packet. And that's why we think of it as momentum. But, you know, more in terms of the abstract operators, you know, in the Born rule, it's like you have no choice but to interpret this as momentum. It comes out of the Born rule. Mm -hmm. and so in the fact that the commutator with a Hamiltonian gives you the time evolution of an operator gives you the, gives you the derivative of the operator so this whole formalism you know we don't have to accept you know you don't have to hypothesize that that's momentum mm-hmm it has to be momentum if you mm. believe in the Born rule and you believe in 
you know, this inter in this formula here. Mm -hmm. So that's where that comes from. All right. So have you had an effort today or do you want to? Um... Well, so we were going to do the calculations. So that would be for next time. Is that right? Or yeah, how maybe next we... time. And then, and then maybe what we do is one grand synopsis where the whole thing is consolidated into something that Can... looks like a, yeah. And so, um, so anyway, we, we gotten up to building the, the abstract edifice, you know, and mm -hmm. now what we're going to do, well, you know, just a preview next time. We're going to look at um, what is, you know, um, what we're actually going to look at is the Schrodinger equation again and um, and then reinterpret it not in position space, but in momentum space. Um, because in momentum space, because momentum is associated with differentiation, as we just showed, that this mm -hmm. is just multiplication by momentum a couple times. Mm. And that's what kinematics is all about. That's what kinetic energy is all that's about. That's right. So if you interpret things in momentum space, this looks like P squared over 2M here times the wave function of momentum space. Hmm. And then this, well, you know, if you take the, you know, uh, that, you know, we have to justify that looking at things in momentum space is actually a Fourier transform. Because we're trying mm -hmm. to turn diff, you know, multi, you know, this differentiation operator into a, a multiplication, which is what Fourier transforms do. But what do they do to, uh, what do they do to products? They turn them into convolutions. Mm -hmm. So you can write down the Schrodinger equation in momentum space, and we'll get there. But I'll write it down for you right now. And this is very good. Um, I'll do something with this. Uh, this is a work in progress, but this is kind of like your understanding of quantum mechanics that, you know, we're kind of like documenting. And it's very good for me because I'm trying to come up with a, a new way to think about these things uh, from what I would say is a natural point of view that is given by the combinatorics. So, but you have a natural point of view given by your physical insights, you know, thinking about all these things in a certain sense. So these two natural ways may relate, hopefully. And also looking at Feynman's notes. Uh, it's very I mean, helpful. There's a lot to... So... Um... And what is VH? And what is um, 5T? That's one over the square root of H times the Fourier transform of the position wave function. Mm. So the momentum quote unquote wave function is the is a transform of the position wave function, but you have to scale it. Um, if you want to, if you want this to be p squared over two m, you have to scale everything by x over h. I'm sorry, p over h. So you have to have a little bit of scaling to get to are these uh, H's or H bars or these are just H's. They're not H bars. Okay. Yeah. So um so and the nice thing about uh showing your equation in momentum space is check out when your potential is equal to zero. This is just the multiplication operator. 
I'm sorry. So these H's aren't Planck's context. This is just a. This is just H an is index. A, H is Planck's constant. Yeah. It's just oh, it is a Planck's constant. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's not H bar. It's H, but it's not H Planck's constant over two pi. It's just Planck's constant. Okay. By the way, um, if you look at um, the uncertainty principle, mm -hmm. is and position you get, you know, the standard uncertainty principle. So that's another thing. Mm -hmm. So we'll call this P, uh, capital okay. P. So it says that uh, delta X, delta you know, P is greater than I, is, you just get H bar over uh, two. Mm. If you interpret, you know, with these operators, multiplication by X and, and this operator P. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. So a lot, uh, you know, a lot comes out of this oh. uh, automatically. And then you get mm -hmm. this, um, you know, Schrodinger equation in momentum space. And the reason that that's so nice is because there's no potential if you're in free space all the time evolution does is multiply by p squared over 2m. It's not a differentiation operator, it's a multiplication operator. So it's easy to solve. It's super easy to solve mm. that differential equation. And we're going to solve it and get an e explicit solution for a wave equation in free space, both in momentum space and in position space. Mm -hmm. And then when you solve it, you realize that, um, that it spreads out over time. And... Um, it spreads out in such a way that the variance of the position uh, goes with a certain speed, spreads out with a certain speed, and that speed is you know, something like, I don't know, 5% or, or the speed of light or something, uh, mm -hmm. uh, maybe 2% of the speed of light at if you're confining a, the original wave packet to the size of a hydrogen atom. Mm-hmm. And so what you've done here, I guess, is that you've, in the Schrodinger equation, you've replaced the derivative with respect to x, you know, with this uh, p multiplying by p, you know, okay. so that's the, and so you're saying that's easier to solve. Um, right. And, and, it's, yeah, I and mean, you're solving it with regards to t, I guess. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it, it, a priori, it's no simpler than what we had before, because this is more complicated. The convolution is more mm -hmm. complicated than multiplication. But if that convolution is not there because your 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 potential is zero, then the Schrodinger equation momentum space is like very, very simple. Mm -hmm. Split mm -hmm. can explicitly be written down. In particular, um, if this isn't there, then uh, use the unitary uh, version of this and you just get the time varying wave function is the initial wave function times e to the i p squared over 2m t over h bar um, and so it's just going to be a complex con a complex um, oscillation term in front of mm -hmm. initial state so it's it's like mm -hmm. a it's like, like a, a wave. <laughs> like a super simple, super simple thing. And then you could take the Fourier transform of that or the inverse Fourier transform to get back to position space. And so in, in my case, I'm, I'm, I mean, I may be wrong, but uh, I'm thinking, well, there's these five polynomial families. There's these five zones and there's these five, uh, what I call space-time wrappers, which are like what you're, the weight functions, I guess you could say, the probability distributions. But basically they take the place of the potential that really there isn't any potential um in a certain sense uh it's all kinematic i guess that's what i'm trying to but we'll have to have to push it through to see if that's actually true but yeah but that's kind of curious yeah so then it would be in very much in the spirit of what you're talking about now yeah i mean especially like when you talk about the Meissner case, which is the general, is that the mm -hmm. general case? That's the general case, right? Yeah, I mean, it would just be, it'd be really interesting to, 
analyze all this in terms of that, like, or the limit of that, you know? I mean, mm -hmm. it just seems discrete analysis is just much more, something much more intrinsic about it. You know? Anyway, we should, I, I think I've got to knock off and-, and uh, Yeah, so thank you, John, for this. Yeah. Uh, it's a really great adventure and uh, it's really a gift to have your physical intuition. And uh, so we'll, 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 I'll salvage uh, what I can of this. Okay. We'll put it together. I'll publish it. Is that all right? I'll do my best. And then I mean, we'll I, continue. I mean, we'll, keep, a, we'll keep yeah. improving it. It's a, yeah. it's a, it's a, it's a rough conversation, but I'm, I'm hoping that we can abstract it, you know, like I can do a sweep yeah. group, uh, so that it, it, it reads more like a lecture, like a, like a cogent lecture. Yeah. We'll okay. get there. All right. Thank okay. you so much. Okay. All right. Peace. Bye. Yeah. Peace. Thank you for watching this video. Please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our Math for Wisdom discussion group and our study groups. Thank you for liking this video, for subscribing to this YouTube channel, and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. It wasn't that long ago I went to the Patreon website, and I signed up there to be a supporter of Math for Wisdom. It literally took me two minutes to sign up, and there I was, a supporter. You should too. It's really easy.